Our text today is the Old Testament reading from Joshua chapter 9. And the men of Israel took of their provisions, and they asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. Here is the Bible story I think you will genuinely like. Sometimes the principles of religion seem so lofty that they are beyond our reach. Other times they seem distant and leave us unmoved. But here is such a tangled state of affairs very much like the lives we lead. The issues in this story are confusing. The cats all seem to be colored gray. You don't even know who to cheer for. Because the bad guys do well and the good guys don't. And it is this feature that is so very true to life. You may remember, Joshua and the people kept their rendezvous with the Lord in the mountain amphitheater of Ebal and Gerizim. There, in one grand act of devotion, they declared their dependence upon the Lord. But while Israel was at worship, the war drums were sounding in Canaan. From the central highlands to the western foothills and all along the sea coast of the Mediterranean, the Canaanite nations forgot their former feud. They buried the old war hatchet. And now they banded together to put a stop to the forward march of Joshua. And the kings of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites closed their ranks to put a stop to Israel. With one exception. And that explains the strange delegation that now comes into the camp of Israel. They appear to be worn and weary travelers, tired and spent from a long journey from a distant country. Their beasts of burden are loaded down with worn out baggage and cracked wineskins. Their clothing is all tattered and torn. Their sandals are patched and worn. The bread in their sandal bags is dry and moldy. And ushered into the presence of Joshua and the elders, they state their case. We become from a far country. Now, therefore, make a treaty with us. It's all in disguise, a ruse, a clever trick. These are Gibeonites, a Canaanite nation that lives not a full day's march away. They come from a strong confederation of fortress cities, not far from Jerusalem. They knew what their Canaanite brothers knew. But they took a different course of action. Their options, as they thought, were three. Defeat Israel, be defeated by Israel, or find some way to stay alive. The elders of Israel were suspicious. How do we know that you don't live among us, they asked. You see, like Jericho, the entire land of Canaan was under the ban, the curse of God. Moses made that clear to them a long time ago. You cannot coexist with the Canaanites, those who hate everything you stand for, who are hostile to the teachings of your God. There can be no compromise between faith and unbelief, obedience and rebellion. 
There can be no harmony between the God of Israel and idols. Who are you, Joshua asked them. Where did you come from? There's something about this whole get-up that doesn't ring true. We've come from a far country, they said. We have heard the fame of your God and what he did unto the Egyptians. And to the two kings of the Amorites on the other side, Jordan, kings of Bashan and Heshbon. Wisely, they do not mention the recent victories of Jericho and Ai, because if it came from a far country, you wouldn't know the current news. And they tell him, our leader sent us. They told us to come unto you and make a treaty with you. It's just like saying, by gosh, we know a winner when we see one. And we would like to join with you folks right from the start. Because we can see that you're a nation that has its act together. And was it the flattery? I mean, vanity on the part of Israel's leaders pleased to think of themselves now as a world power whom everybody else is trying to woo? Or did they go by the sincerity of the speaker, the evidence before their eyes? Joshua and the elders of Israel broke bread with them. They sealed the treaty by a common meal. They made friends with what didn't know it. Never dreaming that the little decision they made here is going to have a far-reaching consequence for years and generations to come. I don't know how he did it. You know, before the campaign against Jericho, Joshua wrestled with the Lord in prayer. The elders of Israel went down upon the ground before the altar of the Lord when they were defeated at Ai. But they figured, this is small potatoes. We don't need the Lord's input on this decision. And that's what the text is telling us. They sought not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. They did everything else. They weighed the facts. They discussed the pros and cons. They projected the diplomatic implications. Democratically, they took a vote. But the one thing they didn't do, see, was find out what the Lord's will was in the matter. But isn't that true to our own lives? We'll pray, I think, when it comes to some great decision, joining the military, beginning a new job, buying a house. But when it comes to the little decisions, who thinks of the consequences they may have in our lives? Pulling your car out into traffic. Some offhand remark during your coffee break. Going out with a favorite girlfriend on a date for the evening. Never dreaming that it can change the rest of our lives forever. That's why Jesus taught us to pray for daily bread. I mean a common crust of bread. To commit the little things of our lives into our Father's keeping. That's why Jesus pointed to the little things of life to assure you of your father's providential care. The little baby in arms, the fowl of the air, the lilies of the field, the hairs of your head which are all numbered. You see, to us, appearances are deceiving. All that glitters is not gold. We can't tell the phony from the folks who are real. I don't know if it's a little decision I'm making or a big one. 
The tares to me look much like the wheat. The wolves keep coming, but in sheep's clothing. Till the day of crisis, you don't know the good shepherd from the hired. We can't analyze everything, figure everything, understand everything, judge everything. That's why we must commit the whole of our day. Little decisions included into the eternal keeping of our Father. Well, you knew how this story is going to end. Three days later, the cat's out of the bag. But you knew it would be. The elders of Israel discovered that they had been goofed. Could we? They had made a treaty with a Canaanite nation. Not only a nation that lived in the land, lived in the heart land. Here they got to go out and fight the Canaanites. And now they got one harbored right in their own bosom. True to life, the people of Israel murmured against their leaders. How could they be so blind? How could they be taken in by a few broken down donkeys and moldy crusts of bread? How come our leaders didn't know the clear commandment of God and why didn't they follow it? The way anybody in your neighborhood tavern knows how to run the entire federal government and coach the Green Bay Packers better than those who have the job know how to do it. Well, all credit to Joshua and the elders. They took the blame. They admitted their mistake. And they kept their word. Even though the treaty was unwisely made, the promise once made could not be broken. Give them credit for that. They were people of their word. And they didn't use a lot of loopholes now. Diplomatic double talk to exterminate the very people they had promised to be friends. The Gibbonites fooled us. We've got to spare their lives. But Joshua said, they will not be our equals. They will be our servants. Cures of wood. And drawers of water shall they be for the house of our God. Well, that's the story. And what do you make of it? It's easy to fall to Gibeonites for dishonesty, isn't it? To criticize them for their hypocrisy and their trickery. But they did a great thing, don't you think? They bet everything on one card. They knew God's purpose for their land. They threw down their arms of rebellion at the feet of Israel's God. They agreed to the purpose of the Lord of Israel. They did what Rahab once did. The woman of Jericho, a prostitute, she gambled her whole life on one car. My life for yours, she said. And, of course, she kept her word and saved the lives of the spies of Israel. And whatever else you might think about the Gibeonites, they weren't cowards. And they weren't fools. They took quite a gamble. Ran quite a risk. Requiring the coolest kind of courage. Nerves of and a vast knowledge of human nature. And what's wrong with that? Did you ever notice the unorthodox ways that people came to the Lord? The lady that crept up in the crowd behind Jesus touched the hem of his garment and then disappeared. Those four guys that tore the roof off of somebody's house to bring their buddy on a stretcher to Jesus? 
Nicodemus, that scaredy cat, came to Jesus by night because he didn't want to see have anybody see him do it in daylight. One guy climbed up into a sycamore tree. And you know one who even tried to walk on the water to get to Jesus. But the thing was, they came. And how about you and me? Are our motives so pure? Our methods so clean? Who knows why you and I are here today? To keep peace in the family? To please some loved one? To set an example for the children? Because you made some bargain with God? Purely out of habit, perhaps? I know of a church where all the young guys went simply because of all the pretty girls that attended there. But Jesus said, Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. You've got to commend the Gibeonites for their faith. And you can condemn them for their method. They didn't have much to go on. But they did beautifully well with the little they did have. And the result was, they became a part of God's people. Oh, they had to chop the wood and draw the water for all the sacrifices at the house of the Lord. It was humble work, but necessary work, and it was sacred work. There on the doorstep of God's house, they found shelter under the everlasting wings. And in all of the years, all of the changing scenes in Israel's history, these Gibeonites never betrayed that trust. They never misled Israel away from the Lord. Amen.